Thank you for viewing this podcast of a talk by Paul Pinhorn, Chairman of the Hampshire Genealogical Society. It's one of four such talks organised by the Hampshire Archives Trust and the Hampshire Field Club Local History Section for the Community Archive Forum, which has been running for several years. First presented in September 2020, this version includes answers to questions raised by participants. Paul has been a member of the Hampshire Genealogical Society since 1987 and has in turn been a member of the Ringwood Group, Group Leader, Hampshire Genealogical Society Trustee, Vice Chairman and most recently Chairman. And so Paul, I'll now hand over to you for about 30 minutes and ask you to hand back when you're finished. Many thanks. Okay, thank you very much again for inviting me to come along. Um, on January 24th, 46 years ago, at the Friends Meeting House, Hilsey, in Portsmouth, a packed room assembled to listen to Michael, Michael Walcott give a talk entitled Making a Start. It was based on his own experience researching into his family history. Initially, this group was known as the Southeast Hampshire Genealogical Society. Since then, the Hampshire Genealogical Society, as it is become known, has expanded to a membership of approximately 1900 from all over the world. The objectives of the society is to collect, publish, coordinate and make accessible in the interests of family history any documents or records particularly relating to the county of Hampshire. The society also promotes the presentation of such documents and records which we make available on CDs and PDF files. Recently, we have published records of the Royal Observer Corps, the Hampshire Regiment and the Wills Beneficiary Index. We also hold lectures, outings, meetings and discussions, give advice and guidance and issue publications. I shall elaborate on how the Society meets its objectives, how with the help of volunteers over the years, we have advanced research of our Hampshire ancestors and how we are looking to advance family history research and the aims of the society in the future. I will also give you hints on how you should undertake your research and some of the many tools available to family historians. The HGS is a charity and it is governed by an executive committee comprising of 13 trustees. Membership is currently £15 per year and the member is able to attend any of the 13 group meetings held across Hampshire. They have access to our research centre located in Cosham. Members also receive a quarterly journal called the Hampshire Family Historian. We have made this available on the HGS website or as a hard copy. We are trying to move people to the electronic copy as it reduces our postage costs. The cost of postage overseas is expensive and the membership fee hardly covers it. We hold records in our members only area and have made some free to view as a taster for non-members to view. The society currently has 13 groups across the county. We have groups at Fleet and Farnborough, Andover and Basingstoke. In the west we have Ringwood and the New Milton groups. Other groups can be found at Alton, Fair Oak, Fairham, Gosport, Portsmouth, Romsey and Winchester. All groups meet in the evening except for an afternoon group in Fareham. Each group is responsible for setting their programme for the year and are allocated a budget to cover the speaker fees. Fees for the hall rental are additional and are paid from another budget. You will find that each group has a varied programme. We do not just research the names and dates of our ancestors, Family history is more than that. As we say in genealogical circles, we have to put flesh on the bones. The groups have their own members evenings where they share their knowledge and experience. They may also take part in transcribing records. Recently, some groups were involved in the transcribing of the Knowles charity books from Romsey. Groups often have guest speakers giving talks on all aspects of social and local history. That is why there is a synergy between family history and local history groups, something the Community Archive Forum, through meetings like this, is trying to establish. Our first journal was called the Family History Journal, 
and was published er early 1974, consisting of several pages typed, duplicated and stapled together without any photographs. It is interesting looking back at its presentation and content. It was explaining how to log your research data on postcards for easy retrieval. How different it is these days. Now our journal has been, is called the Hampshire Family Historian and has been published every quarter since. A professional journal with approximately 60 pages and including photographs. As I stated earlier, we have our own research centre, currently closed but located in Cosham, and it is open for three hours, four days a week. There we hold a vast number of records. These include civil birth, marriages and deaths, as well as many Hampshire parish records covering baptisms, marriages and burials. Our volunteers have also recorded monumental inscriptions in all of the cemeteries and burial grounds in Hampshire. Many of these records have been put onto CDs and this has been a source of income for the HGS. We have a large amount of books covering local history throughout Hampshire. We welcome visitors to our centre where our visitors can use Find My Past to aid their research and our volunteers are on hand to help with their research. For complex and time-consuming research, the HGS charges £15 per hour. <laughs> For many years, we have had our own website, and last year we carried out an upgrade. The website is accessed using the URL hgs-familyhistory.com. As you can see, there are a number of drop-downs that give you access to several areas. There is the membership area, which allows you to join or renew your membership. From research, you can, re, you can view what we hold in our library. And it lists the records that are available. In shop, it gives you information of what is available for purchase. We have indexes to parish records going back nearly 500 years, which can be purchased on CDs. One of our members, has published over 100 village booklets. We have monumental inscriptions covering practically all the cemeteries and graveyards in Hampshire. We also sell historic maps and finally the Eve McLaughlin guides, which provide a vast amount of information on how to help with your research. The area group page will provide you with information on when the groups meet and their programme. Finally, our members area allow members to download the quarterly journal or view records not normally available elsewhere or locate other members that are searching the same name. The HGS has its own Facebook page which is regularly updated by one of our members. Experience has shown that putting reports in the Hampshire Chronicle has generated new members for the HGS, example the Winchester group. Our bookstore travels to family history shows around the country. Not only does it provide income for the society, it provides much needed publicity and many new members have joined through this method. <coughs> so how do we get started? Excuse me. I always advise people to collect as much information that they can from their relatives before it becomes too late. I once had some information um, come with Reader's Digest which suggested doing family history but that was many many years ago and I thought it was just something snobs did so I never did it and unfortunately a lot of people have died since that time and I haven't got the information I could have had. Discard so I just had something <laughs> wrong there. <laughs> But just start. So there we are, collect as much information as possible from family members. Do not discard anything, assume nothing until you are able to verify it is correct. I know of instances where a family celebrated 25 years of marriage to find out that the parents had only been married 24 years. 
she didn't let the children know that she was pregnant at the time she got married. Also, I know of somebody who, when we couldn't find her mother's birth a bit, we located after 30 years that in fact she was adopted. So there are a lot of anecdotes out there that you can um, learn from. Note your sources. Make a note of the sources where the information has come from, as you may need to refer to it at a later stage or to prove accuracy. Start with yourself and then add your parents. Each generation doubles the names you collect. You may wish to put this onto a pedigree chart that shows each generation. There are several free programs available to store your data on. For example, you can use Legacy, Roots Magic and Family Tree Maker. You may wish to you may wish to start using several of the free websites, the websites that are available. Family Search from the Church of the Latter-day Saints will provide you with births, marriages and death records taken from church records around the world. This is a very helpful for records to the start, before the start of civil registration in 1847. Another one is Free BMD. Free BMD will provide you with births, marriages, and death registrations from 1837 through to 1992. You are able to filter to select each of births, deaths, and marriages. You can also select a range of years as well, so you don't get too many entries. And also, by using the mother's surname, you can also avoid unnecessary responses. Next one is the General Records Register Office website, which was introduced just a few years ago. This allows you to view birth records from 1837 to 1919, and 1984 to 2004. Other sites do not give you the mother's surname before 1919, but with the GRO, it does. You can also use the mother's surname filter here to reduce the numbers of options that come up. This site is an excellent tool to use as it picks up births for families whose children have died in between the census records. Death records from 1837 to 1954 and 1984 to 2019 are also available. Free BMD and the GRO provide registra registration district, the volume and page numbers to make ordering of the certificate straightforward. These websites will involve subscriptions, but there are occasions when a trial period is available and this is worth trying. So Ancestry is probably the best known website for family history research, as it often sponsors TV programs such as Who Do You Think You Are and Lost Families. I believe this program has been responsible for the popularity of family history research. Depending on your subscription, you may search records across the world. Ancestry is often found in libraries where you will be able to research for free. Records of census returns, births, baptisms, marriages, deaths, military records, emigration and immigration records, and much more are available. You can also find other people who are searching the same ancestors. The next one is Find My Pass. Find My Pass is another excellent site for researchers. Many of the parish records transcribed by the HGS can be found on this site. In addition, a number of Portsmouth births, marriages and burial records have been added by the Portsmouth Record Office. Much of the same sort of records as Ancestry can be found on Find My Pass. Got down here, birth, marriages, death, parish records, census, churches, religion, directories, education, institutions, military armed forces, travel, migration, a varied amount of data is there. 
Another site is the genealogies. But you need to subscribe to this one as well. And this holds many records not held by a lot of the other sites. In fact, this record is the only one I can find which hold records for tithe, which will show who owns fields or, or farm the fields in various villages and towns. The fourth one on, on my list here is the National Archives and Record Offices. I have shown the National Archives and Record Offices as these hold many records not found elsewhere, which can be downloaded for a fee. The Hampshire Record Office is an excellent source for those with Hampshire ancestors, as it holds copies of most of the Hampshire parish registers, plus a lot more relating to Hampshire life. One thing to remember is that it is estimated that only 10% of records are actually online. So you may need to visit one of these places and trawl through the many documents they hold. So here's a slide from the National Archives showing many of the areas that you can access and get uh, information on. Right, now I'm going to show you some examples of the documents you find and explain those areas of interest. The first census was in 1801 but this was used for quantifying population in the country at the time. And like the 1811, the 1821, the 1831 did not provide any names. However, there are some available where the enumerator did give names and you may be lucky to have an ancestor on these. The 1841 census is very basic compared to latter ones. It provided the address, name of the people there on the night, their age and their occupation and whether born in a county. This um, example here shown gives us the address as Stoke Street in Portsea. The first name is Maria Pinkhorn. Now this should be Pinhorn, but this is a common mistake with census recordings. The person giving the information may not be able to read or write, so may not know how the name was spelt. Also, how did the enumerator hear the word with accents and the like affecting the same? If the person is 15 years or less, the age will be given as the actual age. But if the person is over the age of 15, it is then given in, age, in bands of five years. So you would have 20 to 24, and from there we have 40 to 44. No relationships are shown, but fortunately this was added from 1841 onwards. Also, we have in here the occupation. So the occupation would just show labourer. And then this final column was, were they born in this county of Hampshire? In this case, we are showing yes, yes, yes. Not the actual place they were born. Now this is the 1911 census. It is a vast improvement. This record shows a full address, which would be down, down at the bottom here. And here we have 16 Town Street in Lamport. It also shows the number of rooms in the home. And there appear to be nine rooms. Sorry, I apologize. Sorry, it's six rooms in the house. And we also have the signature of John Pinhorn, who is my uh, great grandfather. The next slide shows not only the relationships of the people in the house, but their ages. So we have John Pinhorn, who is the head of the household. It shows his age, true age of 48, but also shows the length of the marriage. Now this is the first year this was shown, and this is really useful as it will tell you when the marriage took place. It will also show how many children were born within the marriage and how many are still living. So we now know that one child in 1911 had died. The next one is the 1939 register. And this was taken at the end of September in 1939 and was used for the issuing of ID cards and later at the start of the National Health Service. Listen, you may notice there are some surnames which have been crossed out. Similarly here, 
This indicates a change in name, presumably through a marriage. On this slide, we can see a bit more detail. And here we've, we're seeing the address, which is number two, happens to be Lincoln Road. We have the name Pinhorn Bertram S, which is my grandfather. And we show that he is a male. And for the first time, we have his actual date of birth, 22nd of July, 1901. And it tells us that he is a general labourer. Now, when you're looking through 1939, uh, records, you will find that the, the female is normally shown as an unpaid domestic, uh, I says unpaid domestic duties, basically housewife. We also find here the name Pinhorn has been st struck through and Jones. This shows that Olive remarried somebody called Jones, happened to be Edward Jones, and here we have 47 written here, which suggests that marriage took place in number in 1947. You will see there are some records which are closed. This is because the person is considered to be less than 100 years of age. However, as deaths occur, these do become updated. The register is also available on Find My Past and you are able to have entries corrected if you find they are incorrect. Whereas this register shows the date of birth, it is only as accurate as that provided. There are many errors on here. Our next record shows a typical baptism record from All Saints in Portsea in the year 1913. It shows the date of the baptism. It shows the child's Christian names. We then have the Christian names of the parents, their surname, their address, and the father's accommodation, uh, occupation. In this particular record, we are lucky enough to have the date of birth added in the column. This is not a usual thing, but it certainly helps um, before civil registration took place. This next slide is a typical parish record of a marriage. It shows the usual, usual information we expect on the certificate we have all seen in the past. This one is from 1858. And this one is useful in as much as both spaces have previously been married. However, we now know the maiden name of the bride as her father's name differs. So if we look here, we have Bunday, but her married name was Pinhorn. So this is very useful information to find out what her maiden name was, which would help in trying to obtain her date of birth. The next slide is showing, a, again, a typical parish record for burial. And this is from the parish of Portsea. And here we don't have very much information, but we do have James Pinhorn. We know his abode was Ropes Walk. We know he was buried on October the 21st, and we know his age is five. But is the age correct? Because only the deceased person probably knows what the actual age is, if it is an adult. Obviously the father would probably know a child's actual age. Now I'm gonna look at some additional sources. First one is military records and the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. These, this is a useful aid as it provides descriptions of the person, his service record, information about their conduct, conduct, etc. In our family, we have the legend about my great grandfather who deserted from the Royal Artillery and then enlisted under a different name. And after over 25 years, I found the information. His service record under Lewis Flint was disgraceful and he was always in trouble. But when he signed on again as Albert Ward, he did 21 years and left as a company sergeant major with an excellent record. It'd be interesting to see what changed there. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission is a free site looking for ancestors there and it will provide you with information on the death and burial site and may provide parent details. There's also a site associated with this that will actually find 
the gravestone and provide you with a photograph. So go online and look at the Commonwealth War Graves and it will give you the details for that. The next one is newspapers and periodicals. This will give you plenty of information. Your ancestors may have their birth, marriage and death details published, or they may have well have been involved in a crime or a disaster. Immigration and emigration records, again available on the paid sites, may show you their departure to the USA, for example. The record will show the date and the ship, their age and their occupation. Who are they going to stay with? And where did they depart from? I recently found a record for my wife's ancestor following a tip off about a stained glass window in an Irish church referring to Michael Hannan from the USA. On the record it was shown as he was leaving my wife's grandfather's residence in Liverpool and meeting up with their sister in America, something we didn't know about. Many of our ancestors may have been in the workhouse and there are many poor law records that can be searched. This often shows whole families in there or it may be uh, just members of the families that have become destitute and have to be supported. Did your ancestor leave a will? These records are often giving lots of names and relationships. It would say who the testator is, it would say perhaps the money is left to a son, left to a wife, left to a cousin, left to an uncle, these sort of things. But why are some people excluded in wills? Could be interesting to find out why that happened. Next one is directories. This will provide you information about addresses and people's occupations. Kelly's are a prime example and you will find them in most uh, libraries. Centuries ago, the Lord of the Manor managed many aspects of life in their manor. He dealt with disputes between people. He, he dealt with who owns the land, who farmed the land and much more. Even the names of our ancestors who may have only been agricultural labourers can find, be found here in manorial records. School admission records can provide date of birth and addresses. The school logbook gives us a, life, a look at life at that time. The mother who sends her child to school with boils as she cannot afford doctor fees. Or the day all the children were allowed to go to the annual fair. These are all sorts of bits of local history that you will find in these books. So what about the future? Well, HGS, we want to publish more transcribed records online for our members, but this requires volunteers to do this work. Not only a source of income for the HGS, but an added benefit for members. We will probably do away with CDs in the near future and allow downloads and the purchase of memory sticks containing many records. In 2019, I was able to restart the Winchester Group, but unfortunately Southampton folded at the end of the year. With over 100 members in Southampton, surely we need a group. We have made full use of Facebook and this has proved very popular. However, we suspended the Twitter account as this requires to be monitored very closely to provide timely responses, something we do not have volunteers for. The need for social distancing has inadvertently caused many organisations to review their operations. Like so many others, we have, we have embraced video conferencing and many groups now use it. Last week, Ando had visitors joined from Canada and I am hopeful this will lead to many more of our overseas members to feel included. So genealogy is not just dates and names, it is much more. How do they lead their lives? What were the hardships they endured? Local history adds the meat to the bones. Therefore, we want to forge links with local history groups, just like tonight. And finally, we want to establish relationships with other organisations with an interest in family history. Not just local history groups, but others such as craft groups to learn how our ancestors lived their lives and learn more about enhancing our knowledge of our ancestors. So thank you ever so much for giving me the, allowing me the time to speak to you.
Well, anyway, Paul, thank you very, very much for a fascinating talk, um, which will be extremely valuable to anybody with an interest in family history and indeed local history or any sorts of history. I mean, um, I think anyone really with an interest in history ought to join the HGS. And thank you for uh, watching this podcast. We hope you will also view other talks on Community Archive Forum, which we are organising on um, organising local archives, researching poor law records, and running a successful local history group. So thank you very much and take care. Um, the first question um, we were asked was how many members of our HGS are from overseas and where do they come from? Well, looking at our records, in fact, 10% of our uh, members are overseas. Um, and what we have is um, basically an equal share between Australia, New Zealand, Canada and US. We do have others in Malta, Bermuda, South Africa, but the majority of them are held in, uh, are in the, um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the US. Um, does the HGS have a method of putting people in touch with people who can help? Well, we do have a research centre down in um, Cosham where people can come and we can help there with their research. But we also have an email address, which is research at hgs-online.org.uk. And those emails are picked up by our researchers and they will be able to help you um, with your research. Another question is, which of our CDs, booklets, etc., are the most popular? Well, we, the CDs on our birth, marriages and deaths from pre-1837 are very popular. And then after that, we then have our Eve McLaughlin booklets, which um, sort of explain to people how to do their research. Uh, might be on uh, looking at illegitimacy, old handwriting or simple Latin, those sort of things. But when we go to a show, what we actually find is that the books are more popular and the CDs are not. So it's, it's a bit strange that. Um, we've got all the various sources online you mentioned. Is there a convenient list somewhere? Well, we don't have a list on our website for it. But what I would suggest is there is a website called Cindy's List. And it's Cindy's C-Y-N-D-I apostrophe S cindy's list and that gives you absolutely loads of links to very various many sites and you can just put in your interest and it will show those another one is does the hgs have links with national societies and other counties well there's two things we're members of. We are members of the Federation of Family History Societies, um, which all family history societies are eligible to join. And they provide education for groups, they provide insurance, and they also run a number of the family history shows as well. And we also have regional groups as well. So Hampshire is part of the SWAG, which is the Southwest Area Group. And we do hold meetings twice a year, as well as an open day where um, people can, can attend. Another question here, which is uh, last but one, is some wheels are in the local record office. Can I get wheels at Kew without visiting? Yes, you can. Go online and wheels are available to see. Now, if you catch this quick enough, because of the pandemic, you may still be able to download these free of charge. Normally there is a charge for about £3.50. But when looking again, just recently, I did notice it was still free. But yes, they are there at Q. You need to do a bit of searching for it. If you've got a popular name, you might have to look through lots of names to find it. And finally, the last thing um, we were asked is, what sort of things do you want volunteers for? Well, most of our volunteers do a lot of transcribing, which makes it reasonable. We've got CDs and PDFs, things like that. 
and we are currently transcribing uh, loads and loads of records of Britons who died overseas. Uh, a whole collection, boxes and boxes of bits have been cut out of papers. So we're doing that. And also we're looking at wills as well. So not just looking who the will belonged to, who the testator was, but who were the beneficiaries of it? You know, is there somebody in your family who actually got something out of it? Um, and also if there's people who have got um, experience of doing family, family history research, we would love them to help us as well. It'd be really brilliant to have extra people on there, even people that might pick up emails and, and deal with it for us. So some very good questions there and hopefully some answers that would help your, your viewers. Excellent, <laughs> really good. I've learned a lot there. And I think really the final thing to say is anybody with an interest in family history ought to join the HGS as soon as possible. 15 pound, well worth it. Well worth it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Paul. Okay. All right then, Baron. Yeah, take care. Thank you, bye.